Toyota Drive today, we finally get behind the wheel of Toyota's lifestyle pickup truck in its natural habitat and check out the updated lineup of Bajaj Pulsar NS motorcycles. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Sony Dutt. Toyota India just a year ago launched their very first lifestyle pickup truck, the Hilux in India. And despite it being a very dependable offering in the world, it hasn't quite found its footing in the Indian market yet. So Bert decided to drive this car in its very natural habitat in Rishikesh recently to find out whether it justifies its steep price tag. We're finally in the Hilux. It's been well over a decade since we've been asking for the Hilux to be offered to Indian consumers. But it is here and it is here in its latest generation. This is the A generation Hilux built on the IMV platform. Fairly expensive. That was one of the biggest headlines that came out when the Hilux was introduced in India. But today I'm going to see just how worth it it actually is. Now, the Hilux is one of the last few of the body and frame chassis pickups or rather off-road recreational vehicles. And that is principally down to it being needed to work and operate in areas where infrastructure is still very weak. Which means you've got bad roads, off-road trails and various other obstacles for which a ladder frame chassis works pretty well. This was built to explore the outdoors, to get out there with your family, with your friends, explore the wild. So if you're that kind of person who likes traveling, who loves road trips, it makes a lot of sense. The architecture also boasts of a much more powerful drivetrain. You've got a 2.8 litre turbo diesel engine and that makes about 500 newton meters of max torque. The advantage here is that that torque comes in as low as 1400 RPM all the way up to 2800 RPM. So not only is it a massively large torque band, it's an enormous amount of torque that you get at a very low engine speed. Having said that, my one concern with this is that like all BS6, large capacity diesels, you've got a DPF in it as well, a diesel particulate filter. And the challenge with diesel particulate filters, as I've experienced over years, is that at higher altitudes, when you're running richer mixtures, the filter tends to get clogged up pretty easily, very quickly. What I do like about this engine is that the peak torque, the 500 Newton meters of torque, comes in very early. In the manual transmission, it comes in at about 1400 RPM. The automatic that I'm driving comes in at about 1600 RPM. At 1600 RPM, you're in peak torque. And that means you've got an effortless engine, you've got an effortless drive. You're on the boil at all times. You just don't sense a loss of momentum at any given point in time. Step on the pedal and well, you've got power, power and more power coming through this drive train. We've already entered a train. Uh, it's a broken patch. It's a broken tarmac, small bits of tarmac here and there are visible, but largely it's all turned to dirt. And this is where you get a sense of what the ride quality is like. And I must say I'm quite impressed with the way this is working. The independent front suspension, and despite it having a leaf spring set up at the rear, ride quality is quite sorted out. The Hilux offers a rear diff locker and electronic traction control to make any off-road work easy. However, when the rear diff is engaged, it switches off the ETC on the front axle, essentially making this a three-wheel drive instead of four. So if the front wheel starts spinning, then the rear axle is all you have to get yourself out of a sticky situation. For most off-road conditions though, the ETC, which Toyota has developed over several years of the Hilux's existence, is more than enough for all the hard work. So while doing the moguls or the articulation track, uh, this is where we can clearly see what the underbody is like. And you'd notice that at the rear, you've got a leaf spring set up. And this is vital because the Hilux is essentially a load-carrying 
pickup truck, which means it needs a much stronger suspension setup at the rear. Most pickups have got a leaf spring system at the rear as well. And uh, that's also because a lot of the weight comes onto the load bay. Uh, this also makes the pickup a little bouncier, but don't bother too much about that. That's an inherent characteristic in most of these SUVs, even the pickup trucks with the rear leaf spring setup. At the front, you've got better articulation. I'm just going to move this up ahead and you're going to see just how well <laughs> well, we couldn't get it up in the air, but nonetheless, have you seen, uh, it lands pretty softly. The flatbed Toyota says it's got a payload of about 500 kilos, but I think it would be a little more than that, which also means that you could fit in two of your motorcycles, two large capacity motorcycles inside this. And this is a bit of an advantage, is that they've got fastening points fitted in here and they're at a lower level. Now these can be modified again, you can place them higher if you want, but these ideally work for in a much nicer way because they are at lower height than what I have seen in uh, the D-Max and it makes it easier to fasten things when they are lower. All in all, uh, given the length and the width of the flatbed, I think you can comfortably accommodate two large capacity ADV motorcycles in here and head out on your adventures. The Hilux is everything it has promised to be. It is fun, it's exciting, it's dynamic, it's highly capable in this terrain. And then there's the versatility as well. It's an immensely diverse car with so much of functionality, so much of capability that makes it very hard to refuse its proposition. If you're interested in finding out more about the cabin and the features of the Toyota Hilux, there is a longer duration video of the Hilux on our YouTube channel. Do check that out. We'll take a very quick break here on the show. But coming up on the other side, we tell you all about the updated Bajaj Pulsar NS motorcycles. Stay with us. You're watching Overdrive. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. The Bajaj Pulsar NS lineup has been updated for 2023 with new legs and new shoes. Does that make these motorcycles relevant for our times? Let's find out. 10 bucks for a cup of tea. Quite expensive if you're addicted to it. In fact, I read somewhere that in places like Pune, a typical working individual drinks up to five cups of tea a day, out of which four are at tea stalls like these. And apart from tea stalls, the other thing that Pune is famous for is Bajaj, the company that introduced us or got us addicted to motorcycling, thanks to the Pulsa. Today in the power commuter space, they have pulsers ranging from 125 to 250 cc capacities and there are three options if you are shopping in the 150 to 160 cc range alone. All three feel pretty much the same though, racy, rev happy with excellent handling dynamics. So your buying decision is largely based on what fits your pocket. And in today's times of easy finance, if you were to simply drop two cups of tea from your daily routine you should be able to easily cover up the gap in the EMI between the Pulsar 150 and the N160. And should you give up buying tea altogether every day, in that case, you can easily stretch yourself to the new top of the line 160 from Bajaj, the NS160. But is it worth giving up this addiction? Let's find out. At a passing glance, the Pulsar NS160 may not appear new at all. It wears the same old clothes but sports new colour schemes. The bodywork is attached to the same old frame too, but the bike rolls on new wheels and front suspension. The wheels come from the Pulsar N250, which means the tyres are now wider too. 180-17 up front and 130-70-17 at the rear. These wheels bring along the same Grimeca disc brakes as the Pulsar 252. It would take an eagle-eyed onlooker to spot this new hardware, but a clear giveaway of the new Pulsar NS's design are the new 33mm upside-down forks, which replace the standard 37mm legs of the older model. These shouldn't be too hard to retrofit on an older NS160 or 200, but will be an expensive affair considering you would have to change the new wheels and the brakes as well. These upgrades won't come to the smaller NS125 though, which is seen here testing in its 2023 Avtar with a BS6 Stage 2 compliant engine. 
speaking of the 200, all these updates are seen on the 2023 NS200 as well. But you know, the good news is all these updates aren't restricted to the NS160 alone. They also flow to the NS200, which means that apart from the body panels and the instrumentation, even the cycle parts are all the same between the two. That means the suspension is the same. The spring rates are also exactly the same. The width of the rims, the width of the tires or the tire sizes are exactly the same too. Of course, you can see different tire patterns here. That's because these are two different suppliers. Who knows, these tires could go to the 200 tomorrow, or these tires would come to the 160. But either way, the only differentiator between these two motorcycles is the engine, the powertrain, how it delivers power and how much of it. Otherwise, the handling dynamics between the two, exactly the same. You continue to get a 160cc single cylinder oil cool mill with a 5-speed transmission on the smaller NS versus the 199cc liquid cool motor and a 6-speed gearbox on the pricier sibling. Both the engines remain largely unchanged though from the BS6 counterparts but are OBD2 compliant now and can comfortably run on the E20 ethanol blend as well. Out of the two, the NS200 has the superior motor not only in terms of the displacement or the power but also in terms of technology. Triple spark ignition, liquid cooling, KTM 200 Duke derived internals et al. Even its leg guard mounting is similar to the Duke. Now when the suspension and the wheels are common between the two, there's a difference in what they do to the curve weight of these two models vis-a-vis -vis the outgoing counterparts. Now the suspension, it's two kilos lighter than the outgoing model. The inner tube of the forks, it's slimmer, 33 millimeters instead of the 37 on the outgoing model. And because this is USD, there is lesser stainless steel, more aluminum, so that helps save the weight. So two kg is lighter here. And the wheels, they come from the Pulsar N250, so do the brakes. So the wheels are saving about 500 grams each, so that's one kilo saved with both the wheels. So that's three kgs down, but that's only on the NS200. When you compare the NS160 to its outgoing counterpart, the weight has actually gone up by a kilo. So while they are saving weight here, there is a bit of weight addition with the new brakes because dual channel ABS, now standard on the motorcycle, and there is a little bit of equipment change here and there that has sort of led to the weight going up a little bit, but only one kg up, which I don't think is a big deal. Have your chai without sugar and you'll probably compensate for that within a month. There's plenty more we have to tell you about the engine and the riding dynamics of these motorcycles. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're with us on Overdrive. Now the Bajaj Pulsar NS lineup of motorcycles are known to offer plenty of engine options at very affordable price tag. So we are here to find out whether the updated NS 160 and the 200 offer better ride quality as well. The NS 200 had already gained one horsepower when the BS6 transition happened. The updated engine is compliant with the new OBD 2A emission norms, so no problems there. Now with that additional power and the reduction in weight, it has a power to weight ratio of 155 PS to a ton. So if you think about it, if you are a spec chic nerd, that is better power to weight than even the Pulsar 220F, which was once called the fastest Indian. It's also more than the new Pulsar N250. So if you need good power to weight ratio, this is the best Pulsar in the lineup. While the improvement in the power to weight ratio may be hard to notice, you are likely to feel the improved front end stability offered by these new forks. We didn't have complaints about the outgoing NS's handling dynamics, but the new one feels more planted even through mid corner bumps like the ones that are prevalent through the bowl on Bajaj's chart and test track. The lighter wheels also make for slightly sharper turn ins, and the new forks complement that attitude but going hot into the corner can make the front feel skittish. The rear suspension could have done with a slightly stiffer setup too. The improvement in handling is a lot more noticeable on the NS160 and as before, its motor feels peppier than the 200 when it comes to initial or low-end power delivery. Both these engines are peaky though and love to be ridden at the limit and the new handling package complements that approach. So while the upgrades seem minor, anyone who loves the pulsers for the handling dynamics will appreciate the efforts put into improving the NS. Have they done enough though? Maybe not. 
the new NS line still leaves one wanting for a slipper clutch and a few more things. Honestly, I have a bit of a soft corner for the 200 NS, for the way it handles, for the way it rides, but then we have to go nitpicking. Like I remember, right from the first 200 NS that I rode, up until the new one, I've always felt that the brakes could have been better, especially the front brake. Under hard braking, it often goes a little too hard. This is even true for the non-ABS variants. So it's essentially the oil heating up and the brake just not feeling confident enough. In fact, you can sometimes not have any braking from the front at all. You're solely relying on the rear brakes or the engine braking. That front just goes very hard. There's probably maybe a millimeter of travel at the most and just doesn't work. And unfortunately, I've seen that happen even today at the track with the new 200. So I think they ought to have fixed that. Even with the newer brakes, there's still that issue. So I think it's down to the overheating of uh, the brake fluid or something to do with the master cylinder. I'm still not getting a clear answer from Bajaj on why that is happening. So that is one bit of it. The other bit, I think they ought to have gone with LED headlamps now. Come on, we are in 2023. Yes, I know that usually these headlamps in our kind of conditions, they work better than LED headlights, but going with the market requirement, going with what the rest of the competition is doing, LED headlights should have made it to this motorcycle by now. And I think it was also high time to do the Infinity console that they're doing on the other pulsars. Even the cheaper N160 gets it, but the NS160 or the 200 doesn't. So they should have definitely gone with the newer console. And I think there could have been a few quality improvements as well. Like for example, this rear foot peg, we know it's flimsy. We've seen it on the previous NS as well that it tends to go loose after a few years. You can already see a bit of play there. It tends to go loose, starts making those rattling sounds it's not a very good feeling so that should have been improved and what's with that side stand they should have definitely improved that that exposed little nut that you see on the side stand i don't know it just doesn't fit in there it looks like it sticks out like a sore thumb they should have definitely improved on that as well so these few things ought to have been done now that the ns is sold despite these shortcomings the ns200 remains my favorite in the pulsar lineup Maybe it's just me, but this is one bike on which I don't care about the lack of some new age equipment. Bajaj says that two-thirds of the NS models that they produce go to global markets. And Latin America, which is one of the biggest market, wouldn't have accepted a feature-rich NS with a higher price tag. And hence, the upgrades are restricted to the forks and the wheels alone. They could have done more, right? Mm, yeah. At least in terms of design, they could have done better. I agree. I mean, that design is is sort of aging now. But, but I don't know, man. After riding the motorcycle, it just ignites those old memories of, you know, going up and down Lavasa, Mutha Ghat, and then really gunning for it. It still has that charm. It still delivers, right? I mean, the handling is just amazing. Yeah. the uh, On the spec sheet, the uh, upgrades uh, with the forks might uh, seem a very small upgrade, but then when you ride it, there's a huge difference in the performance. The overall uh, riding dynamics has changed. The handling has uh, improved. There's a front end feels so much more confident. Yeah, yeah. There's a big bump in uh, the overall handling of the bike. I agree. I mean, it still lacks a few features when you look at the competition or even its own siblings, right? But then again. If you simply want a bike that is mechanically sound, you don't really care about the frills of Bluetooth and LED headlights and a very fancy looking instrumentation, etc. You want a motorcycle that gives you that on-tap power in this segment. You want a motorcycle that handles really well, is very stable through corners, stable on the highway, etc. I think this motorcycle still delivers. I think it's still my cup of tea. With that, it's time for us to wrap up this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye. Many thanks for watching. <laughs>